you so much for sticking around. I'm Dina McGoy Summers. I'm an English professor at Kentucky State University, and I'm also the composition program coordinator. And my interest is teaching English online, particularly the comp courses. So this presentation is Read the Room, Strategies for Building Online Community. So you can follow along by either using this QR code or you can go to the link um, that's up at the very top. All right, so in this presentation, we're going to go over the role of community and collaboration in effective online teaching. And then we're going to define learning space along with reviewing some tools that can be used to create learning spaces synchronously and asynchronously. And then we're going to describe an approach um, for thinking about this in terms of kairos, which is a rhetorical term that focuses on opportune moments. Now, since we um, lost a little bit of time, I'm gonna kind of go quickly through the material on community so that we can get to some tools. You all, if you're here, you've already thought about some of these issues. So we know that community and interaction are central to our ability to learn new things. And those of us who are teaching online know that we need to be intentional in designing teaching online. So we have to intentionally create opportunities for students to connect and interact in a way that we don't um, typically have to do in our face-to-face -face classes through class discussion. So we wanna build community, but we're doing so within the context where that has to be intentional and where in the physical environment a student is, they might be isolated, they might be distracted, et cetera. So that brings some challenges. Now, nevertheless, students do argue that community is very important. So I have a few quotes here from Jody Donovan's work on um, the importance of community. So students that she spoke to talked about how having those relationships help, help them learn. Um, it gets them out of their own bubble. It helps them create systems where they can check in on each other. And it creates that sense of com camaraderie and community among students. So in your opinion, how important do you think community is for your students? All right, looks pretty safe to say that it's um, somewhat to vary and we're leaning toward very important. So let's go ahead and move on to the next slide that helps provide context. So what some researchers have seen so far is that we see community um, is most perceivable in real-time engagement. So for instance, that would be a synchronous class. However, a lot of us are teaching asynchronous classes or hybrid classes, blended classes, et cetera. And so we might not necessarily get the benefit of um, the real-time engagement. So what we're looking at is creating a system where we can approximate that for other types of connections for students. And this is important, not only in the classroom, but the skills, the ability to collaborate and the ability to collaborate in a technologically mediated environment is important outside of um, our classes as well. So our first step is to really create a relationship with the technology that can contribute to um, the ability to create that sense of community, even in asynchronous classes. So the good news is that um, we know from Miller that in and of itself, computing is not necessarily social or antisocial. And we've also used technology to improve learning. Um, for instance, the alphabet, slide rules, et cetera, um, forever, basically. So we've always had this engagement with technology to improve our practices. 
And that means that we can actually use technologies to decrease issues associated with spatial separation and a lack of connection. So the first step is to be mindful that internet activities are typically set up by function. And so, for instance, um, when we send email, we have a place to do that. When we want to search for something, we have a different place to do that. If you want to um, communicate through social media, there are different types of social media. And students, when they come into the classroom, particularly when they're new, their experience with internet-based technologies are very compartmentalized. However, in our classrooms, we tend to combine those. So to create a relationship with technology is first to be mindful that doing multiple activities within one technological environment might be different for students who are entering the class. And then a second is, of course, to be intentional um, so that we can approximate or improve the experience of our traditional face-to-face -face classes. And then finally, to dissolve the screen. So we use technologies in the classroom, but we want students to focus on the connections rather than the technology itself. So in a classroom, when we're building community online, we're trying to humanize a non-human technological environment. And in the process, creating a learning community. And that is a tall order. Now, there are a few different models of student and in instructor engagement. We have Collins and Burge. Um, they focus on instructional roles that we play, like pedagogical, social, managerial, technical. And then Garrison, uh, Anderson, and Archer have emphasized communities of inquiry. And they rely on cognitive, social, and teacher presence. And then Paloff and Pratt focused on social presence, purpose, process, um, teaching and learning environments. And we can use these together to create a model for student in instructor, instructor engagement that combines pedagogy, space, and technology. And this is where the concept of a learning space becomes useful. So a learning space, by definition, is a place in the surroundings associated um, where teaching and learning occur. So it could be indoor, outdoor, physical, or virtual. When we think about learning space as a concept, we have to focus on pedagogy, space, and technology. So what type of learning are we intending to create or foster? What type of teachings require to facilitate that kind of learning? Where exactly is the learning going to take place and what tools do we need to create that space and to facilitate teaching and learning? So when you're thinking about learning spaces, there are a few principles that can um, guide the design. Those will be sustainability, that the space is personalized and accessible, that it's collaborative and engaging. All right, so we're going to talk about some ed tech tools um, that I found useful in creating learning spaces. Uh, before we do that, what ed tech tools do you use in your classes to facilitate learning? Discussion board, Blackboard. Zoom, chat, and whiteboard. Jamboard. Video reviews. Mentimeter's cool, yep. Video announcements. Poll Everywhere, Mind Maps. Breakout Rooms.
Padlet, Kahoot, Quizzes, Packback, the online publisher material, great. Moodle, Flipgrid, Voice Thread, that's a neat one. All right, so that's a great list. And some of those you're gonna to see today. So I'm gonna talk about some ed tech tools, some of which you just noted in terms of learning spaces. So we'll start with threaded discussions and then talk about Padlet, Miro, Perusal, and Hypothesis. Now to start with, we all know the benefits of class discussion. So discussions are important. They encourage collaboration and the exchange of ideas. They uh, uh, provide new approaches to problems or solution and allow for the analysis of arguments as well as opinions. And they provide opportunities for students to create new knowledge. And so in our online classes, we've often used the discussion board to uh, approximate those class discussions. And the problem with discussion boards, and this is something noted by professors and students, is that um, they're not always very effective. So the images that you see on your screen now are um, from Twitter post. And these are students talking about discussion boards. So the first one, um, a student is, is basically using quite a few big words to make a point or to be satirical. And then another student's poking fun at how they interact with each other, as is the bottom one. So discussion is great for a class. It's something that everyone values, and yet it's difficult to, to pull off, basically. So threaded discussion can be a learning space. It's useful, though, to think about how it's set up when you think about it as a learning space. So on discussion boards that are threaded, we tend to go one by one by one. Now there are ways to make them um, useful in class, even, even though they um, go from one to the other. Um, one example is to use templates so that students have an idea on some great ideas for responding to others. And some other examples, are more creative. So for instance, in an art history class, posting an image and having students create a video response with the image as their background, or posting a business plan for students to review, or having students take turns moderating discussions. So threaded discussions can be um, very useful as a learning space, but they are held back by the threaded component of those. Now we can also use Flipgrid as a learning space. So someone had mentioned Flipgrid on the word cloud. Flipgrid is a tool that you can use, students can use to create videos, something similar to TikTok. And then those videos are posted to a site that you pull up. So the student creates the video. Instead of using a threaded discussion, you use Flipgrid to create a learning space. And then students post their videos in response to the question that you've posted. So rather than being threaded, you have a grid. That means students will quite literally see their peers whenever they're in this learning space. 
They're able to hear one another, be able to um, respond to one another in video. So Flipgrid can be used as a learning space itself that brings students together. And since it's video, we can use it for icebreakers, for math demonstrations, uh, project-based learning, creative performances, book reviews, et cetera. Now, some of you also mentioned Padlet. So Padlet can be used as a learning space. And what's nice about Padlet is that if you use it as a learning space, you can decide how you want your students to relate to each other. So you have the option of creating a wall or a stream. You can create a grid or a shelf. You can also create a timeline where everyone in class collaborates or a canvas where they can connect their ideas to other students, a map or a back channel. So the example you see on this screen is a collaborative timeline. So rather than um, posting on a discussion board, students contribute to build a timeline about what they're studying. And they work together and they're all pulled together on the screen through this learning space. Oop, there we go. Okay, another option on Padlet. This is really nice. This is, um, I believe this is for a photography class. So students post their work on the Padlet wall. It's all out there. Students can see it together. So they're part of the group in this space and they can communicate through the Padlet. Again, they can create a map. This would be nice for a geography class. So off of the discussion board and into a map space. And you can create different relationships with students. So you can have students um, do discussions on the Padlet where they're all pulled together in a group. And you can use the canvas. It's kind of hard to see there on your screen, those lines where students can connect their ideas quite literally to other students' ideas. So Padlet has a lot of options for creating learning spaces where students can connect themselves and their ideas to each other and produce something together. Now Miro is another learning space. Um, it's another whiteboard type of environment. The nice thing about Miro is that it has many different templates, probably hundreds of templates. And if you're interested in creating a space for your students to meet, then they can meet through one of these templates. So the example that I have up on the screen now is a team meeting template. So you would have your agenda and your objectives and then a workspace for the students. And in Miro, students um, work on these post-it notes. So they type out their answers and they group them together as needed based on what the discussion covers. And this is another example of a template in Miro that can be used as a learning space. So you have the topic, your agenda, goals, and who all's involved, and then they have their workspace. Another example for reflection in Miro as a learning space. Then you have brainstorming and discussion spaces. So if you just wanna have a brainstorming with students synchronously or asynchronous, asynchronously, you can create a brainstorming space and they're just using their um, post-it notes with their ideas. Or if you wanted to split them up into groups, you could use um, one of these, these diagrams. So rather than completing, for instance, a discussion board post, you can create a space where students can connect to the subject and to each other and see it all together, the same way that they would see their peers in a face-to-face -face class. This one from Miro is a Likert scale. And then I'm not sure how 
um, I could use this, but I think it's a great idea of creating a radar learning space. Again, bringing all the students together into one quasi room. Now the next example would be tools for social annotations. So we have hypothesis and perusal. And I don't believe anybody noted these up on the word cloud. Uh, but with hypothesis and perusal, if you work with text, so for instance, I'm an English professor. If you work with text, then you can post a text and have students comment on the text through social annotations. And so in this way, the text itself becomes the learning space. To kind of give you an example of learning spaces in my face-to-face -face classes, um, as an English professor, sometimes I'll take my students to the library. Sometimes I'll take them to a computer lab. Sometimes we have class in our face-to-face -face classroom. So we're already using a lot of different learning spaces on campus. And we can also use ed tech tools like Perusal, et cetera, to create learning spaces consistent with synchronous and asynchronous classes online. So we might not be able to go to the library, but we can comment together on a shared text. All right, so when you think about the concept of learning spaces, are there any other resources or strategies that you think could be used or that you're currently using to create learning spaces and online courses? Interactive games, that's a great idea. Spotify. Escape rooms. Podcast. I actually use some um, these tools in class as well. Recorded critiques of peer work, that's great. LinkedIn learning. Um, speaking of Zoom, a lot of the ed tech tools that I show, like Miro, you can actually connect those to Zoom. So you would use the tool in Zoom. Group me and Twitter inclusive self assessments. There's a lot of ideas there that I'd like to try. Now, I also wanted to talk about the concept of reading the room. So when we read the room, we're, we're become aware of what's going on within the room. So that's opinions and attitudes. And the idea of reading the room in our learning spaces um, can be helpful to our teaching as well. And so I use the concept of kairos, which is a rhetorical term for a particular kind of time. It's a qualitative time that translates to opportune moment. 
So it's captured in the notion of timing. If you have good timing, then you um, are really um, good at identifying Kairos. So Kairos involves knowing what's appropriate in a particular situation. And we can use this to respond to what our classes are doing in their learning um, spaces. So the concept of responding to chirotic moments is already familiar to you if you teach in person. So whenever you notice confusion on a student's face um, and you ask for questions or concerns, then that's recognizing kairos. So is choosing to restate a point if you notice confusion or working through another example. And the nice thing about learning spaces is that they give us an opportunity to look at what's going on within a space in that interaction and respond to chirotic moments in those spaces. So when you see everything together, rather than thinking of a student individually per se, you can look at all the student responsive and create follow-up activities, uh, create video reviews of student responses, or even decide to try out a new learning space. So the learning spaces also provide us with the opportunity to think about the class as a whole and what's happening within those spaces that affects their learning or how we could identify and how we can improve learning. So the benefits of chirotic design, this idea of um, creating spaces so that students collaborate and create community and that we can also use to evaluate material that we need to cover, et cetera. Um, it allows students to engage each other and us authentically, and we can personalize the class. So for instance, when I do video responses to a particular learning space, I always make sure to use the students' names. So I'll talk about what happened in their space. Um, let's say that we were practicing thesis statements in an English 101 class. Then I'll go through some of those examples, say their names, and that even just the, the act of saying students' names in an online course where everybody can hear it, that seems to have an effect on community. And they have information that they can use to improve whatever task that they're working on. So it allows for generative responses, um, it continually emphasizes that students are part of a group. So they might be completing activities alone at a computer, but they're part of a shared group. We have a shared goal and objectives and it can create accountability because students need to engage others to move forward. And finally, it's fun. All right, so the, in conclusion, community and collaboration are central to effective online teaching and learning and the ability to collaborate online and work well. It's beneficial even beyond our classrooms because students are gonna have to work in technologically mediated environments. Um, we need to think about or create different relationships with technology or ed tech so that it serves our objectives. And we can actually use our tools to purposefully or intentionally create learning spaces that approximate the same goals that we might have, for instance, in taking students to the library or to a lab, et cetera. And finally, they allow us to read the room and respond to those chirotic elements. Okay, so I wanted to make sure there was time to ask any question or comments. Oh, I see stuff in the chat. Oh, I believe uh, Marian Miserandino asked um, how effective is Miro for increasing students' learning? I think it works well. Um, there is one thing I noticed, and that's that students, for instance, my 101 or 102 students, they have more trouble figuring out how to use it. Oh, and Erica Kane asks, which of the software are free for students and teachers and which of any can integrate into any LMS, into an LMS? 
I think you would have to ask um, the instructional designers about what integrates. I don't need um, a subscription for Miro. They, I think that they give you a free board for up to a hundred students. And Padlet works great. Um, you don't have to create registration or anything like that. I've used Canva too. Uh, some of you have mentioned infographics. Um, you might also want to consider having students create memes or GIFs. That can be easy for them to do, and it's very interesting to see what they come up with. So, for instance, in my literature classes, I'll have students create a GIF that represents a scene, and then we try and guess the scene based on their GIF. Yes. 